Good afternoon, everyone. Pleasure to be here with you and an honor to share with you some things from the Word of God. We're going to talk about faith today. Faith, for many of us, it's a mysterious concept. And one of the best ways we can relate to it is by understanding trust. So we're going to examine this word faith in the Greek and see what it really means. In the Greek, it's the word pistis. Uh, the etymology of the word, its root is to trust, to obey, to have confidence in, to believe. So faith really is having an assurance, having a conviction about something. So to have faith in someone means that you really trust that person enough to obey them, especially when you disagree with them. That is really one of the best examples of what faith is about. You have assurance of their words because you're convinced of their character. You've been persuaded by their life choices. You are convinced by their reputation. If you don't really, if you don't, if you feel you can't obey that person, then I would suggest you don't really trust them and perhaps you don't have faith in them. And so you can see that all, all those words are related to each other, faith, trust, and obedience. Obedience, I believe, is the manifestation of faith. I am, of course, talking about free will obedience, not obedience under duress. When there is faith in someone, you don't really presume any evil on the part of that person's actions toward you. You wholly accept their judgments and their actions done toward you in love, even if you might perceive them as something harmful. But because you have faith in that person, you are believing and presuming that they have a good intent toward you. And that is faith. And that's why you are able to obey them. This is not just applicable in our relationship with God, but the kind of dynamic that I explained to you is really what makes a marriage thrive and grow and feel like a safe place for both the man and the woman. Of course, faith is like a plant. It grows. Just because your faith is small doesn't mean it's bad. You wouldn't judge a small apple tree for not giving apples, right? You have to be patient and wait till it grows. Your faith also won't go from zero to a hundred in a day, a week, a month, or even a decade. You have to let it grow. You have to feed it the right thing. Just like we grow in Jesus. Jesus says, if you remain in me, I remain in you and you will grow. You become a fruitful vine. So faith grows in a marriage as both the parties devote themselves to feed the marriage with trust, with love, with submission, because obedience has to do with submission as both become one. Faith, of course, being something so fragile, like a fragile little plant. I mean, using the plant analogy, a little sapling, a little plant is quite fragile. It's acceptable to all kinds of diseases, all kinds of issues. Somebody can just step on it and there it goes, you know. Uh, but when it becomes big, like an oak tree, you know, try to fight with that. You know, it takes a lot of energy to cut down an oak tree. It doesn't go down that easily. So in the same way, faith that grows like a tree is strong and can withstand all kinds of things. The Psalms talks to us about that. Uh, but faith can be derailed, especially when it's in its young stages. And that's what we're going to discuss in today's lesson. We're going to see from an example how faith can easily be derailed. As I mentioned before, I'm going to be recalling some of the past lessons, like when Peter walked on water, uh, like when Jesus stopped the storm. I talked about faith then as well. Usually what derails faith are strong emotions. It's our passions, our emotions that have nothing to do necessarily with our intellect. It's just that we may feel something. We may feel depressed. We may feel anxious. We may feel fearful. And in those states of emotions, we might decide to do some things that can derail our faith or decide not to do some things. And so we have to be very careful because faith cannot depend on that. Those emotions are emotions. They don't have any moral value. It's what you do with them. So again, faith comes by reason 
and by intellect, not by emotion. Now, can emotion accompany faith? Oh yeah, I believe so. You know, when you're strong in your faith, there are some emotions that are going to come along with that, usually positive ones uh, when you are, have a strong faith. Uh, but when those negative ones come along, we have to learn how to manage it so that it won't be derailed. So let's get into our episode today. We're going to read from Mark chapter 9, so you can go and turn to your Bibles. We're going to kind of sit in those verses 14 and following as we look at this account of a desperate father and what he did with his faith. I'm going to be reading from God's Word translation. We're picking it up right from where Lottie let off when he preached his sermon a few weeks ago. The disciples were coming down. They had been in the mountain. They had a mountaintop experience. They were probably filled with a lot of interesting emotions after witnessing the things that they saw. It was probably like a booster shot to their faith, having been there with Jesus and having him, having seen a whole other aspect that their physical eyes had not noticed before. So the story picks up right from when they're coming down. It says, when they came to the other disciples, they were just coming down from the mountain, right? And they saw the other disciples there. Who were the other disciples? Well, it wasn't Peter, James, and John, because Peter, James, and John had been with Jesus during the transfiguration. But the other disciples were there, and they saw a large crowd around them. And some of the scribes were arguing with them. So these three that had been with Jesus are coming down. They're like, oh, man, life is good. Life is great. This is amazing. You know, it's, an, it's a great experience. But now they're coming and reality sets in. Arguments, discussions, all kinds of things are going on. Some of the scribes we know and the Pharisees, yeah, they looked for any opportunity to really you know, give it to Jesus and his disciples. And this particular in instance here, the disciples had failed to do something. So the scribes were probably having a field day putting down the disciples for not uh, being able to do something. All the people were very surprised to see Jesus and they ran to welcome him. Notice the reaction that Jesus gets when people see him. As soon as people see Jesus, they're running to him. And I think about this. I, I think, am I running to Jesus? Because no, sometimes our tendency might be to walk to Jesus or sometimes to crawl to Jesus, right? But these people are running to Jesus. Are we anticipating our meeting with Jesus? Are we looking for him in our daily ins and outs? Or are we letting what we see with our eyes affect our vision of this reality, okay? Uh, are we seeking his face in prayer and in the word? That's how we seek Jesus. That's how we run to him at this point in time. And this hope really is what keeps my faith focused, that I'm going to see him face to face, as 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 says. So Jesus is there. They're arguing, right? So he asked the scribes, what are you arguing about with them? And this man just suddenly comes out from the crowd. He is a desperate father. He says, teacher, I brought you my son. He is possessed by a spirit that won't let him talk. The father of the victim speaks out. And he is desperate. You can see he's, he's very emotional. He has identified a spiritual problem with his son. He's, he's calling it a spirit. He is possessed by a spirit. Not only has the spirit made him mute, he's unable to talk, but as we will see from the text, it manifests itself in other physical disabilities that this son was exhibiting. So the father is desperate or has been desperate to get his boy healed. He wants this to stop. He doesn't know what to do. He explains here, whenever the spirit brings on a seizure, it throws him to the ground. Then he foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth, and becomes exhausted. I asked your disciples to force this spirit out, but they didn't have the power to do it. So imagine the desperation. The father 
had heard about Jesus, of course, as so many in his community had. And he was like, oh, great. You know, what an opportunity. I think I can get my boy finally healed after so many years. So he brings him. Jesus isn't there. He's like, okay, where is Jesus? <laughs> I want to see Jesus. But he wasn't there. But his disciples were. But he had heard that the disciples could also do stuff. But imagine the disappointment. Can you imagine the disappointment? I'm sure some of you had had some disappointing times when your hopes were up, maybe because of some place that you were anticipating to go, maybe because of some medication somebody told you was going to heal you or help you in some way or another, or a vitamin or a supplement, and you're taking it and nothing is happening. You know, there's disappointment. Sometimes disappointment causes our hearts to take a step back, doesn't it? We're like, I don't want to be hurt again. I don't want to be disappointed again. The father realizes they don't have power over this spirit, this unseen force that is wreaking havoc in his child's life. And many of us struggle with that. We struggle with unseen things, wishing we had some kind of power over them, things that we can you know, physically fix. You know, I'm, I'm not too uh, able to fix things. I, I don't have the knowledge or the talent to fix physical things myself, you know. Although I'm getting a little better, you know, YouTube has been a great teacher to me in helping me fix some things. And, and when I'm able to do it, I feel like, yeah, I did it. I, I have some power over here, over something. Uh, but when it comes to the world of computers and internet, which usually is unseen, right? I, I have a little bit more of talent there. And I know some of you get very frustrated. How do I fix this Wi-Fi or how do I download it? And, and oh, don't worry, you know, that's, that's easily fixed. But there are many things that are of that unseen nature in our lives that are of a spiritual nature, like faith, like emotions, right? We only see the manifestation of those things, but we have no idea you know, how to fix that, how to make it better. How can I make it better? And sometimes we're wrought with frustration and anxiety because we might be feeling a certain way and we don't know how to feel better. Some think they know everything. You know, the truth is that we know very little and that's why we get very frustrated. We think, some people think that they have solved things that they know <laughs> all mysteries, and they try to give you a solution. But honestly, when it comes to the unseen things, the more you think you know, the more open to deception that you really are, unless you're looking in the Word of God, uh, because the deception really comes from within our heart. That's where it comes from. Imagine the Father's great frustration over this failure. Think of the woman who bled for 12 years also, you know, because she also had a condition for so long. And sometimes people, when, when they've been frustrated and let down over and over and over, they become very sarcastic or, or, or very bitter with life. You know, they've had, kind of had it. But something about that woman, though, who bled for 12 years, she still had a sliver of hope in her, didn't she? Because she still, when she was right there behind Jesus, she was like, if I could just, if I could just, touch him and that was the sliver of faith that made the difference for her just that little bit just that little inching if i can just get there so i could imagine the father as well here had been disappointed over and over again you know trying to get his son healed and sometimes our faith in this process of continuous disappointment our faith gets hurt you know our faith suffers because of all the letdowns. And I'm here to tell you it's because of lack of focus. It's not the faith that's the issue. It's where you are placing it. That's the issue, as we will see here. <laughs> Jesus has something to say. He says, you unbelieving generation, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Sounds like a, the parent of a, of a child, right? Uh, the parent of a young person. Uh, bring him to me. 
You know, when you got to do something right, you got to do it yourself sometimes, as Jesus is saying here. He also is frustrated frequently. It's interesting. Some people are frustrated because their faith is misplaced. Jesus is frustrated too with that. When he sees our faith being misplaced, he is also frustrated because he can give them a solution. He has it. They're just not seeing it. They're misplaced. It's misplaced hope, misplaced faith. Isn't it interesting that in the midst of giving them so many signs to believe, he still calls them an unbelieving generation. See, when our faith is misplaced, it causes a problem of unbelief. It's not the faith, it's where it's placed. You understand? Because we all have some kind of faith. It's just where is the focus of it? Here, the Father's faith was placed in the disciples. Maybe it was placed in people, but it wasn't where it needed to be. With so many thinking that they have the right answers and approach to life in this generation, I would say that judgment still applies that Jesus is giving here. We are in the midst of a faithless an unbelieving generation. Wouldn't you agree? But there is something that can be done. Show them Jesus. That's all you got to do. I know it's not as simple as that, but that's a start, right? Jesus was showing them how everything is possible with the Father. If they had their faith in God, but they were still not able to, To see that the little faith these disciples had was still being derailed by a misplaced trust, misplaced hope. I'm asking you this afternoon, where is your hope placed? What do you hope to accomplish in this life? Are you hoping in people? Are you hoping in things Can you even really depend on yourself or on someone else? Don't you know people by now? Can't you see that everything in this realm that is visible, that is tangible, is really destined for failure? So if we put our hope in that, our hopes are going to fail as well. Who is dependable? Ask yourself the question then. Who is dependable? Who is trustworthy? Who has shown himself time and time again to really come through and is always going to be on your side. And you can always trust what he causes in your life. There's only one, really. There's only one. And isn't that the point God is making by giving us Jesus? Isn't that the whole point of the Gospels that we are studying? I have really learned to trust other people because I'm first trusting God and I'm trusting what he is doing in my midst and what he does through other people. I can trust that because I look to God for the answer. <clears throat> I know I'm not more dependable or less dependable than anybody else, but when my hope is in God, I can still be at peace even through disappointments or failures. I trust God is always working even in those disappointments because I trust that whatever action he takes that affects me, even if I may perceive it as hurtful or even just plain wrong, I can trust it because it comes from God. That is faith. Don't allow yourself to be disappointed because someone doesn't get your plight or your issues. <laughs> They're only human. Turn to God, not to people. When you first turn to God and are satisfied with him, then you can let God minister through the people in your life, especially the church. God never disappoints. But if we're putting our hope in people, our hearts, I think, get changed for the worse. Bitterness, sarcasm, unbelief, lack of faith. Lack of hope. All that kind of sets in. It works against us. 
And the hearts get changed for the worse when our faith is misplaced. And I think that's what Satan and evil powers are looking to accomplish here. They want us to trust in people, their ideas, their constructs, their worldviews. He wants you to lean on your own understanding and trust yourself. But can we really trust ourselves? We can trust ourselves as far as we can throw ourselves, and that's not much. Our hearts change for the best, though, when we trust God. Because when we trust God, we grow in faith, we grow in hope, we grow in love. We're open to the peace of God, and actually our relationships benefit with each other when we're getting our faith from God. So they bring the boy to Jesus, and as soon as the Spirit sees Jesus, it threw the boy into convulsions. He fell on the ground, rolled around, foamed at the mouth. Jesus asked the father, how long has he been like this? The father replied, he has been this way since he was a child. Now, something that strikes me from this verse is that even though no one else there, I mean, everybody saw Jesus. They saw that this person and they knew there was something special about him, but they still doubted. They still had trouble putting their faith in him. But. How did the evil spirit react when he saw Jesus? Isn't that an interesting contrast? He knew exactly who Jesus was. And he was troubled right away. And we see that happening in other occasions when evil spirits see Jesus. They, you know, they, they get all out of control. They're, they have a cow in front of Jesus because they know what's coming. So the evil spirits right away recognize. The spiritual dimension knows who's Lord. As James says, even the demons believe, but they shudder because they don't obey. And that's why we can say they don't have faith, because they don't obey. But we have trouble believing, <laughs> and so our faith struggles. So I see this contrast always. The evil spirits recognize right away who Jesus is. They testify to the power of Jesus. They know who's in charge. The unseen can see the seen, but we who see the seen can't see the unseen, and we have trouble with that. We have trouble believing. So the demon, the father says, has often thrown him into the fire or into water to destroy him. And then the father makes a plea here. If it's possible for you, put yourself in our place. Help us. The plea from the desperate father. In the NIV, it says, if you can, if it's possible for you. Here we can see the father's disappointment. If you can. Those words, what do they express? Kind of like a doubt, right? If you can, if it's possible. See, the demon, when he saw Jesus, he knew his time had come. <laughs> he wasn't saying if he can. Oh, he knew he could. But the father says, if you can. Isn't that an interesting contrast right there? Well, the father had had his disappointments. He knows people are limited, even in how they relate to one another. So he's begging Jesus, look, put yourself in my place. Think about me. Take pity on our situation. He's trying to ask Jesus to relate to him like we would with other people, right? We sometimes speak that way. Try to understand my hardship. That's really the most we can ask from each other. We don't really know each other's plight as well as you who are the one suffering it. Yes, you know, we could use the human proverb, if you could walk a mile in my shoes, but that is kind of a hopeless expectation at times. Maybe we will meet somebody that can relate to us a little better than someone else. Maybe because they had a similar experience. But is that all we're looking for? People take comfort in relating to others with similar issues. But 
I think it does little for hope. It doesn't really give you peace because the solution is still lacking. The father thinks he knows what he needs. He's looking to Jesus as another human who could possibly help him, as he looked to the disciples. But he doesn't really know who is standing before him, does he? He doesn't really know who is there like the evil spirit knows, does he? There's a disconnect right there. And this is a picture of us, okay? This father pleading, begging, if it, God, if you can, help me find a new job. Lord, if it's possible, get me out of this situation. How many times have you prayed that way? Like this father. You know, if, it, if you can. Treating God, I don't know, like a human? Or like a genie? <laughs> Not really looking to develop a deeper connection with the Lord, with your Father, with your Heavenly Father, which is really what this is about, what life is about. Not just getting solutions, but understanding what we're going through, the journey. Haven't you heard the saying that the journey is really what gives significance more than the destination? We're going through a journey for a reason. What makes marriage great, by the way, is the journey. We're not getting anywhere. We're getting to the grave. That's really the destination. But it's the journey that is meaningful. Yeah, and of course, the destination in heaven, not knocking that, that. That is our ultimate destination, yes. But how are we relating to the Father in the meantime? Are we just saying, if you can, if it's possible, or are you just want your three wishes how is this connection? Because that's the point. And I think after you see what happens here, that that's what Jesus and the Father are looking for us to react in. So Jesus answers, as far as possibilities go, everything is possible for the person who believes. Amen. <laughs> Jesus does take pity on the man. I mean, he knows our plight. He knows our condition. That is why he is literally, or he literally walked in our shoes. That's the whole reason the author of Hebrews tells us. To relate to us. He became a man to relate to us at, in levels that we cannot even understand. So what should be our understanding or how should we uh, reciprocate that? Isn't it trying to relate to God somehow in this plight? I know it's, it's hard to wrap your head around that. But God's desire is to relate to us. God's desire was for us to walk with him. That's how, why he created Adam and Eve, to walk with them, to have a close relationship. And Jesus' incarnation is the proof of that. But we need to believe him. Let's not trust people. Let's stop trusting ourselves. And let's stop looking for our needs to be met apart from God in Christ Jesus. Let's start looking to God to have our needs met. And something that troubles me greatly is to hear Brethren's hearts being troubled by political, scientific, societal propaganda. You let that trouble you enough to disturb the life that God has laid out for you attached to this ministry. I can't help but feel troubled for those who are letting those things affect the ministry that God wants you to do here. Troubled enough to sometimes even move somewhere else as if that would fix things. Is that a move of faith, I ask you? Or is that a move of emotions? 
Is that an emotional reaction? We get emotional. Oh, I got to change my job. We get emotional. Oh, I got to change things. There's this grass is greener on the other side syndrome that kicks in whenever we find the trouble. But I ask you to look at Lot. I mean, yeah, Lot <laughs> initially didn't decide to, his first decision to move to Sodom was not a good one, I'll tell you that, <laughs> you know, when he decided to go there. But while he was there, his heart was troubled. And he was called a righteous man. And his heart was troubled living in that place. So I'm sure your heart is troubled living in this place. As we see the news, hear about what's going on, see what's happening. I don't know about you, but my heart has been troubled since 1990 or thereabouts. <laughs> and I don't know when it will stop. Probably never. Probably not until I see Jesus. I thank, thank you. But that's okay. It's okay for your heart to be troubled. Lot's heart was troubled. And God called him righteous. But did Lot say, oh, I got to get out of this place. And he was in Sodom. I think that would have been a good choice. But he waited till God said, okay, you know what? You got to get out, Lot, right now. Even to the point where the, he was kind of like lollygagging around and the angels had to grab him and physically take him out. But when something troubles us like that, let, we let it trouble us enough. Get us anxious enough to disturb the place and the ministry that God has given us? Think about that. Are you going to make your choices by faith or by sight? That's what I'm asking you to consider and be careful. Because, yes, we're all going to be tossed to and fro by our own presumptions, by mostly really by our disbelief which is why Jesus rebuked them, you unbelieving generation. That's what's going to cause us to be tossed to and fro and back and forth as we go through this life. Because our faith, when it's young and inexperienced, is fickle. One moment we're walking on water like Peter, <laughs> and the next, you know, we got distracted a little bit. Now we're thinking, oh my goodness, what's going on? But remember, Jesus is there. He's ready to poops, pull you right out. Don't feel like you have to move anywhere. Unless God is telling you to move. That's a different story then. Seek to understand what journey God has had you on. And really connect by doing what God wants you to do. Which is to let other people see Jesus. That's the only thing that's going to make sense. That's the only thing that's going to help you level things out in your own heart and in your own brain. There is no mountaintop here. It's not South Carolina. It's not Florida. Not that I'm raining on your Florida or your South Carolina or anything like that. It's just not the mountaintop that you might think it is. Because it's really when Jesus comes. That's it. That's the whole mountaintop. It's not Alabama. Not Alabama either. There is no mountaintop here. We're in the valley right now. So we got work to do. Our goal is to show them Jesus. And when we're in trouble, we got to do like this dad did right here. I believe. Help me in my unbelief. I believe, Lord. But I recognize that I need help because I don't, my belief is not where it's at, where it needs to be. That's what he's saying here. I believe, but I sometimes don't. <laughs> I believe, but, but, but help me because I'm weak. At least he was honest. I think we need to be honest like him. The father recognizes his faith is not where it needs to be. And I think we need to recognize that, especially when some kind of trouble or anxiety is causing us to want to move or be displaced in a way that is not in keeping with faith, but it's more in keeping with your own emotions. Do you see the difference? Do you, you understand the difference between those two? It's important. Because otherwise, faith will be stunted. 
Because what are you going to do then when you get troubled again? When trouble follows you? You think there is a place on earth where trouble's not going to be there? You think there's somewhere that you can go where everything's going to be great? You know what? I would avoid that place because then that's not going to make my faith grow, then, isn't it? Because faith grows by stressful situations. When there's tension, that's what makes faith grow. You know, God, I've been reading through Jeremiah and Ezekiel lately as I'm doing the uh, Bible reading podcasts. Man, those are really depressing books. And Jeremiah and Ezekiel, they went through some tough things there. But thankfully, God even said there, nobody's going to experience a time like this again. When I read them, I say, thank you, God, that I don't have to go through that. Those were tough situations. And when you read Jeremiah and Ezekiel, you get a good sense of God's heart and where it's at. You can really get a clear picture. God is not shy about opening his heart to us. And it's right there for everyone to see. And what hurt him most is how people just turn their backs on him because they're seeking human assurances through false prophets, soothsayers, anything else except trembling at his word. Really the only balm that can heal us, his word, they turn their backs. And that's why God was so disappointed with them. And I think that the disappointment Jesus expresses here is the same thing. He's disappointed that he is the bread of life and he's giving them the bread. And they're like, no, 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 we want a stone instead. We want people. So God is looking for changed hearts. And, and I think that this cry of this desperate father is exactly the point that Jesus wants all of us to reach at some point. I think I've re been reaching it every day since 1990. You know, this point helped me in this walk. Because this means when you're here at this crossroads of faith, that you're going to grow, that you're growing. This is a good thing to be there. It's a good thing to be there, to be at, at your wit's end, but still looking to God and running to him and asking him to help you. It's good to be there because God is with those who are brokenhearted as opposed to being somewhere else. And this is the place where growing happens, where a changed heart happens, where faith gets strong as we cry out, God, help us in our unbelief. Jesus sees a crowd rushing to the scene. He gave an order to that evil spirit. You spirit that won't let him talk, I command you to come out of him and never enter him again. He rebukes the evil. And the evil comes right out of the child. Brothers and sisters, we can't, we can't soothe evil. We can't be nice to evil. We can't be enabled by evil. We need to do like Jesus did here and rebuke the evil that is in our lives. Order the evil that's in our heart and that it's in our, in our mind. Order it out. Order it to cease and desist. Don't toy with the evil that comes from your heart. For sure, don't entertain it because that is going to derail your faith. Anything that keeps you from running to God and to his word is evil. Recognize that. Make that black and white in your own mind for your own sake. Who is in control of your life, your heart or your mind? Who is? You have the power to choose. Choose Jesus. The evil spirit screamed, shook the child violently and came out. And the boy looked as if he was dead. And everyone said, he's dead. And Jesus took his hand and helped him to stand up. You know, evil doesn't let go easily, does it? <laughs> you know, here he didn't want to let go. He knew who Jesus was, but he didn't want to let go. And this poor kid, you know, shook him up. It screamed, made this whole scene. Evil always likes to make a scene. You know, evil is flamboyant. It likes to 
cause a scene. <laughs> and in your life, it will. It's holding fast to your heart. It's got you. It grabs you. You got to rebuke it. You got to let it go. But it's not going to be easy. It's going to be very uncomfortable choosing it, especially if you've been feeding that evil for a while. It's going to feel like it's even a part of you. And when you try to rip it out or really give yourself over to Jesus, it's, you're going to feel like you're dead, <laughs> which essentially is what happens. Be prepared for the evil in you to scream, to kick, and to shake you before it goes. But if you value your souls, let it go. Kick it out. And it's going to come out, especially if you have the Holy Spirit. And if you've been baptized, it will come out. It cannot reside in the same place as the Spirit does. One who is following the Spirit cannot follow the flesh. Read Romans chapter 7 and chapter 8. Paul talks a lot, all about that right there. And Jesus is going to help you stand again as he did this child. So when, did the, when Jesus went into the house, the disciples asked him privately, what, what went wrong with us? You know, what happened here? We tried to get this evil spirit out, but we couldn't. Why couldn't we do this? They were wondering. And sometimes we wonder too, like them. Why didn't something that we expect from God happen? You know, is God against me? Is God closing the doors? And I think this, I think I can attribute this to our presumption that we think faith is like a cookie cutter process. You know, I push these levers, pull these levers, push these buttons, and, and it's going to happen for me because I'm a Christian. What does that mean? Well, hey, I, I go to church. I, I give my, my contribution. I do my Bible reading. I pray. So, you know, I expect God to make my way smooth. And when that doesn't happen, I might be like the disciples. What happened here? You know, I thought, why couldn't we take it out? We might feel God's hand is against us, even though we think we're doing everything right. But it's not like that. That's not how it works. It's much more personal than that. Faith is not a to-do list. It's not like, okay, I keep this pattern that I think God is what God wants from me. And everything is going to go super smooth. It's not how it works. I'm not saying that it's bad to read the Bible. All these spiritual disciplines are great, mainly because they're going to keep my faith focused. That's why I do them. But if I do them just in an expectation to have God do something for me, then I'm deceived. That's not how it works. I do them for me, for my faith with God. You know, there is a difference, isn't there? Uh, when I lived with my parents and I did the dishes, I did the dishes just to keep them off my back. And they knew that. That's why they were like, at least you did the dishes. <laughs> they knew why I was doing it. But then after I moved out and I came back and I voluntarily did things that they didn't ask me to do, then they were very thankful and grateful. That's the difference. You see the difference right there? That's the difference. I'm doing these things because I want to be close to God. Because I want to be right for God. Even though I know I'm not. But I'm thankful that he made me righteous in Christ. And that's why I pray and I read the Bible. And I, and I try to let others see Jesus. It's not a formula. It's not a cookie cutter. And that's the difference. That's what Jesus is highlighting here. His disciples probably were feeling comfortable with the power Jesus had given them, and they thought they were in control. But Jesus then tells them, this kind of spirit can be forced out only by prayer. There are going to be some things that grab a hold of your life that you're not going to be able to shake unless you have that kind of a relationship with God. That's what he's saying here. This kind of evil spirit can only be put up by prayer. And what does that mean? Some versions that by prayer and fasting. And this is really about self-denial. Because Jesus didn't pray, did he? He didn't first say a prayer and then took the evil spirit out. So what he means by prayer is an indication of the kind of life that Jesus had. And we know from what we've read so far in the Gospels 
that Jesus spent a lot of time praying. He invested heavily in his relationship with the Father. He had a tight connection. And so for him, everything was possible because God made it possible. And he knew that. There was no doubt there. For him, prayer was not something on his to-do list. But for the disciples, they hadn't learned that yet. And so that's what he's highlighting here. This kind comes only by prayer and fasting. You need to have a tight connection with God in order to overcome certain things. And that's a lesson for us too. As we mature, that spiritual connection needs to grow in order for you to keep evil at bay, in order for you to triumph with good over evil. We know that it, good triumphs over evil, but it has to be a good that comes from you, that you desire, just like Jesus' relationship with the Father. And then you will be able to overcome any of these things. So just to point this out, we know that the disciples had some faith because they did cast out some of the spirits, just like Peter did walk on water, but it wasn't a faith that was mature yet. It, had a faith, it was a faith that had to grow as evidenced by this instance where they were not able to cast out those demons and as evidenced by when Peter sunk in water. That shows that faith needs to grow. We can't just be at a certain point in time in our Christian walk. We need to press on and we need to make sure we grow in our relationship with the Father. Peter, James, and John had witnessed something that the other disciples had not. They had seen Jesus glorified. Maybe their eyes were opened a little bit more. But it was not the size of their faith that's being addressed here, but the focus of the faith, who they were trusting. Jesus says anything is possible. So I ask you, where is your faith? At this point, I thank Mark for the Lord's Supper lesson that he did, because the lesson that he gave has a lot to do with this as well. How are we examining ourselves? Do we think, do we treat the Lord's Supper? And it's not like we're supposed to examine ourselves like right here when we come into the building. Oh, I'm going to take the Lord's Supper. Let's examine myself. No, that's like a to-do list approach. You've, you've got it all wrong if that's what you're doing. The examining is supposed to happen every day. Just like your relationship with the Father. Am I worthy to be in this kingdom? Do I realize whose supper I'm taking every Sunday? And what does it mean for me? And so when you come here on Sunday, you're ready to take it. Because you're walking in this manner of life. And you're blessed. It doesn't matter what storms are happening in your life. That's not the issue. Some people make that the issue. Oh, I feel terrible because this is happening and that is happening and I don't know what it is. And that's always being turbulent in your life. And you know what? For the rest of your life, you're always going to be feeling that way. You will have no hope. But for the person who's walking there, oh, they're going to be great. They're going to be blessed. It doesn't matter what's happening because they know where they're going. And see, that's the difference right here. Jesus' gospel is it highlights that in us. God gave us Jesus to show us physically in a way that we can try to understand how much he loves us and that he wants our heart, our attention, not sacraments and sacrifices. He wants our purity in the form of obedience because that is faith, as I, as I said in the beginning of the lesson. How much I obey is a result of how much I'm really trusting God. His dedication to us is shown by this cross that we are reminded of every Sunday. And the purity that he maintained in his life was the same purity that he show us and that he desires from us to him to keep until he returns. This is something that we need to let into our heart as we grow in our faith. Our response to this kind of Faith to this kind of love is to believe, ultimately, to believe him, to trust him, to look to him, to come to him, to realize that he's our only hope. And if we're touched by this commitment to us and we understand what Jesus is looking, then we take those steps to baptism. 
to making that commitment with him because we trust him 100%. But it's only the first step in a long series of steps, the first step of growth in a long series of steps until our life here on earth is done. If you want to pray, if there's something troubling your heart, like this father felt in his life, you know, as he, oh, something not responding, technical difficulties. There we go. Oops. That was a delayed response right there. There we go. Oh, now it's going the other direction. There we go. So if you have something in your heart that you want to pray about after services is over, I'm going to be right here. Some of our other brothers are going to be right here to pray with you. If there's something that you need to let go, if there's something evil, if some evil has a hold of you and you know it because you're not in the right state of mind, let's pray together. Let's ask God to take that out of your life. Let's pray God to give you some discernment, some illumination so that you understand that you are in control. Give it over to the Lord. If there's some unbelief that you need to address in your life, that's what we're here for, to call together on our almighty God, who's the only one who gives us these solutions. So I invite you to come forward and pray as uh, we stand and sing. God bless you. Have a good day. Good afternoon, church. It's always a blessing to be before you for the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. I want us to really picture a time in our life in which we went to the doctor for an examination. Usually when you go for an examination, it's never usually you're in there for five minutes and then you're out. It's usually maybe an hour, sometimes two hours, and sometimes three hours. It's usually a lengthy process. When you think of examination, it's usually whoever it is that's administering that exam going through a meticulous process of going through step by step to ensure that whatever it is that they're checking, it's accurate. That's the same correlation that takes place here in 1 Corinthians 11, 28. When Paul urges the Corinthians to let him examine himself so that we could proceed to eat the bread and drink the cup. That examination that, that Paul references here is for us to really take the time meticulously to go through things before approaching the Lord's Supper. But it also says something else when it tells us to examine. I'm going to fast forward things a bit. Another, another, I would say, way to view examination, and I'm sure most of us will be familiar with this next phrase that I'm about to say, is that we've heard this, either been told to us or we've said it. We've told someone at some point in time to check themselves, or someone has told us to check ourselves. When Paul refers to examination here, he's really asking us to check ourselves before approaching the Lord's Supper. To me, the two takeaways is, first and foremost, is to stop. Before any examination takes place, there needs to be a point of you stopping before that examination could take place. In this, in this scenario, before approaching the Lord's Supper, Paul is urging us to stop let us think about what we're doing before engaging in it. Sometimes engaging in something on a weekly basis, we get what we call muscle memory. Sometimes with muscle memory, it doesn't, um, you don't think, you respond. So it's the Lord's Supper's time, it's the time for the cup, it's the, the time for the bread, it's the time for the wine, let's proceed. But in this scenario, let us truly stop and let us truly think. Let us utilize a thought process with that muscle memory. Because another thing that's really highlighted in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight 28 is, before proceeding, really examine yourself. Really check yourself. And what does that mean? Have an introspective look as to where you're at with God before approaching God. It must be stated that anytime you come with less than the loftiest thoughts of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and your brothers and sisters, you are coming unworthy. So it is important for us to check ourselves before engaging in the Lord's Supper, before approaching the Lord in this fashion. Nobody should join in the act of communion thoughtlessly. 
All should examine themselves to make sure they conduct their conduct and attitude are keeping with the supper's meaning, as it states. If you join in this thoughtlessly, as it is were just an ordinary meal, this brings God's judgment upon you. Indeed, some in the church have had this occurred because of not taking the seriousness of stopping thinking before approaching. Christians should examine themselves honestly to see that they are really what it's really like to have that connection with the Lord. And is there anything inhibiting you with that connection? Is it, a, is it a disagreement with your brother, your sister, a family member? All of that should be taken away at this particular moment as we get into deep thought before approaching the Lord's Supper. Therefore, Paul concludes to the Corinthians that they should cease their shameful rush and greed to the Lord's Supper and remember what it's all for. It's not just a feast, it's a remembrance. And as we partake the Lord's Supper today, let us really truly stop, check ourselves before approaching. Let us really truly stop and think about this process before approaching. And let us actually approach with a level of remembrance in the Lord. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. For the Lord is a righteous God, perfect in all of his ways. For the Lord is a righteous God, perfect and worthy of praise. And the righteous will see his holy face, washed in the blood, saved by his grace. To the righteous he promises this special place, right next to his heart face to face. Blessed are all the pure in heart, for one day they shall see God. Blessed are all the pure in heart, precious in his sight they are. And the righteous will see his holy face, washed in the blood, saved by his grace. To the righteous he promises this special place, right next to him, our face to face. Blessed are all the pure in heart, for one day they shall see God. Blessed are all the pure in heart, precious in his sight. And the righteous will see his holy face, washed in the blood, saved by his grace. To the righteous he promises this special place, right next to his heart, face to face. Right next to his heart, face to face. Right next to his heart, face to face. Amen. Recordings.